Bienvenidos a Perú Sostenible. Eh, mi nombre es Micaela Rizzo Patrón, yo soy gerente general de Perú 2021, para los que no he tenido el gusto de conocer. Y muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos esta mañana para el desayuno de deseos con Christian Bush. A los que nos compartieron sus direcciones, espero que les haya eh, gustado el regalo que les enviamos. Y ahí aprovecho para agradecer a Prom Perú por esas lindas tacitas y, y a Andebar, este emprendimiento de Cunan por los detalles y los productos, y espero que disfruten su, su buen café ahora en la mañana. Eh, también en este paquete recibieron una cartilla, ya les pido que la tengan a la mano, eh, es esta de acá, y, y las personas que no recibieron este regalo, sería, le habíamos enviado un correo para que la puedan imprimir, igual, si no se ha podido todo bien, tengan un papel blanco a la mano con un lapicero, ese es mi único pedido. Y eh, la tarea que vamos a hacer luego, la van a poder acceder a través de ese código QR que sale ahí en la pantalla. Eh, con su celular toman una foto y los va a llevar directo al, al link a donde tienen que estar. Ok, eso lo veremos al final de la sesión. Pasamos ahora al desayuno. Eh, bueno, esto es parte de las actividades de Perú Sostenible. Y antes de comenzar, me gustaría compartir con ustedes unas recomendaciones. Lo primero es pedirles que nos aseguremos de que tengamos nuestros micrófonos apagados para que fluya bien eh, la, las exposiciones y no tengamos interrupciones. Y si tienen buena señal, sí creo que es súper importante que prendan sus cámaras, por más que estemos con, con cara de mañanera, pero creo que es muy importante vernos los ojos en estos meses de, de distanciamiento. ¿no? Es algo que hay que fomentar para, para sentirnos más conectados. Rápidamente les, les voy a repasar la agenda de hoy. Eh, lo primero, vamos a, voy a presentar a Aldo Ferrini, que es eh, copresidente con Selma Acosta Rubio de Perú Sostenible. Y eh, Aldo va a presentar a Christian Bush, Christian nos va a exponer por 20 minutos, eh, recuerden que esto va a ser todo en inglés, y luego tendremos un diálogo entre Christian, María Julia Sanz, que, directora eh, de Asuntos Legales y Corporativos de Bacus, y Juan José Córdoba, que es gerente general de Textil del Valle. Y luego tendremos un espacio de preguntas y respuestas con ustedes también. Lo ideal es que, para que seamos igual eficientes con los tiempos, tengamos las preguntas por el chat, todo el tiempo pueden ir comentando por el chat, y Aldo las va a ir recogiendo y yo también lo, lo apoyo por detrás con eso. Eh, y al final nos tomaremos cinco minutos para cerrar la sesión con este ejercicio que les comenté con la cartilla. ¿Ok? Eh, bueno, ahora sin más preámbulo me, me gustaría darle a nuestro, eh, la, el pase a nuestro anfitrión de hoy, Aldo Ferrini. Aldo es gerente general de AFP Integra y uno de los presidentes de Perú Sostenible. Muchísimas gracias por estar, que sea una excelente mañana. Aldo, todo tuyo. Gracias, gracias Mica. Creo que muchas fotos para el rol que me toca eh, hoy día, pero bueno, se, se, se agradece. Bueno, les cuento que hemos estado, y este es el, el tercer día del evento, eh, eh, y la verdad es que los expositores que hemos tenido están, han estado espectaculares. En la conversación hace unos minutos hablaban de que los videos están, están colgados, realmente vale la pena verlos, y si tienen tiempo después de, esta, eh, eh, de este desayuno virtual, eh, les recomiendo muchísimo la primera presentación de John Elkington que sigue en, en el programa. Pero vamos directo al, al, al punto. Hoy día nos toca eh, un desayuno con Christian eh, Bush. Christian es un experto eh, eh, mundi y líder mundial en innovación y emprendimiento eh, y, y le ha metido en, en su carrera mucho énfasis al, al, al propósito. Y la verdad que en muchas de las presentaciones que hemos visto eh, en estos días, el propósito ha, ha sido parte eh, central, el propósito que pueden tener las, la, las empresas. Eh, Cristian es eh, eh, director del programa de Economía Global en NYU y es miembro invitado docente del Laboratorio de Innovación y Co-Creación en la LSE, en el London School of Economics, donde eh, se dedica a de desarrollar modelos de negocio sostenible. Además, es cofundador de Leaders on Purpose, donde trabaja para eh, eh, introducir y meterle fuerza al propósito de las empresas. Y, eh, eh, no menos importante, y, y nos va a hablar de, de eso también, es autor del libro The Serendipity Mindset. Eh, sin mucho más preámbulo, eh, eh, welcome Christian, it's a, it's a pleasure for us, eh, for you to, 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 to join us, and eh, please start with your presentation. Muchas gracias, Ada, and uh, buenos días a todos. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, I used to work in, uh, in Mexico and then later on briefly in, in, in Chile and, and Peru, so I feel very nostalgic being here with you, uh, and I'm really looking forward to a wonderful conversation later. Um, and I also hope that we will get to meet in person at some point once the world opens up again. And um, for now, I'm very excited to be here. I uh, thank you so much, Michaela and team uh, and Aldo for, for bringing us together. 
uh, with such a fantastic group of, of, of leaders uh, who are shaping uh, so much. So I'm really looking forward to first giving a small presentation. And then I'm a big believer that a lot of the knowledge usually is in the room. So also that everyone shares uh, uh, some of their insights. Um, what I'd love to do is, you know, being the German I am, I have a very uh, structured uh, table of content. Um, and so I'd really love to take you on a journey, a journey talking about uh, a bit of the context first, and then how do we integrate profit and purpose? What have we learned from the last decade of work? And then uh, finishing with a couple of action steps that we can do something uh, with, uh, especially in this world that is so full of uncertainty. Um, to give you a bit of context, uh, I had an accident when I was around 18 years old. Uh, I had a car accident. Um, which almost killed me. And before that, you know, I was this rebellious teenager walking through the world, thinking I can control everything, I can run everything. And, uh, and that car accident uh, almost killed me. Uh, and I will never forget the policeman who came, to the, who came to the scene. And he was like, oh my God, he's still alive. So this, this idea that I should have been dead. And that put me on this kind of intense search for meaning. Uh, I started reading Viktor Frankl's Search for Meaning, which is a wonderful book, which is all about this idea that even in the toughest of circumstances, we can find meaning, we can somehow um, understand that there is something we can still do with life. And so it took me on a journey of uh, first uh, starting uh, to build communities, um, then entrepreneurship and, and building companies, social enterprises, and now later on in research as well. And one of the things that I found fascinating, and that is part of the topic today, is that when over the last 10 years looking at the most purpose-driven, successful people, uh, both in, you know, everywhere from Sub-Saharan Africa, where a lot of my research is, to Latin America, to the US, to the UK, the most purpose-driven, successful people seem to have something in common. They cultivated serendipity. They see something in the unexpected, they see something in uncertainty, and then turn that into positive outcomes. And so that is really a big part of the conversation today. How do we turn uncertainty and the unexpected into positive outcomes, such as innovation and, and impact? Um, I want to start out briefly with a couple of findings from um, some of the studies we've been doing recently. Um, one is a, a Leaders on Purpose CEO study, where we took uh, over 40 of the world's leading CEOs of companies like MasterCard uh, and, and Danone and others, and try to understand with them when sitting down, what is it that seems to work better in those companies than in other companies? What are they really doing to integrate profit and purpose? What are they doing to be sustainable over the long run? And so these are just kind of five, uh, five key points that um, form part of the conversation. One was really around this idea that a lot of them have been very conscious about this idea of saying, we have some core capability. If we are MasterCard, we know how financial systems work, we have financial capabilities, but now we want to make sure that we understand the context, especially via the sustainable development goals, and then relate these capabilities to some bigger goals. So if I'm a MasterCard, I want to understand how can I be part of financial inclusion? How can I be part of um, you know, bringing people that were not part of the financial system into the financial system? And so the beautiful thing that happens then, of course, is if I was an employee at MasterCard before, I would say, okay, I, I do a bit of financial transactions. Now, when I'm part of MasterCard, I'm saying, oh my God, we're helping 500 million people to get into the financial system who didn't have access to that system before. So it creates a real purpose. It creates a real idea of, I'm proud now to work for this company because it actually relates to a bigger purpose, a bigger idea of what's out there. And the sustainable development goals for these companies have been very effective as a North Star, as a guiding star that helps them to understand how their capabilities relate to the bigger picture and the bigger problems that are out there. But then one thing that we've identified with a lot of other companies before that was that the problem a lot of times seems to be that, you know, it's one thing that the CEO says, we want to have more impact, we want to have more purpose. But then when I, as an employee, come into the company on Monday morning, do I feel that that is really part of my day-to-day -day activity? Do I really integrate this bigger purpose into the day-to-day -day activities? And so one key thing that we've been very excited about is to, to ask, what are practices that really integrate, that really codify purpose, that codify different values in, in the company? And so to give you one example, if a company says, you know, our purpose is, is to, um, you know, bring financial inclusion or so, and our values is around creativity and, you know, 
um, 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 inclusion and, and some kind of values that, that mean something to the company, what are now rituals that could be relate to that? And so one of my favorites actually in this case is uh, the post-mortem or the project funeral. And so the idea here is, you know, most times in a company when something doesn't work, let's say you start a new project, maybe a sustainability project or something else. And if it doesn't work, a lot of times we try to hide it, right? We hope that it never happens because it's, it seems like a failure. It seems like something, oh, not so good. But the problem is then we don't really learn from each other because obviously the most learning comes from things that don't work. And so the project funeral is all about saying, how do we take the things that didn't work and let people present about this, about what they learned from them. So in this example, there was this company and they produced window glasses. And you know, the idea was that these windows would not reflect the light when it would come in. So it's an amazing technology, but they underestimated that people wouldn't pay a lot of money for it. And so now what they said was, okay, um, the project manager who was responsible for it spoke in front of other project managers from other divisions and said, okay, this didn't work out. And what we learned from it is next time we will look at the market differently. And da -da -da. now someone in the audience goes, hey, 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 have you considered what this would mean for solar? Have you considered if you take that technology into a solar device, how much energy that can absorb? And that is how, quote unquote, serendipitously, their solar division emerged, which is now one of the kind of key uh, or, or part of their solar division, which is now one of their key activities. The point is, it seems very, quote unquote, lucky that that person was in the audience who connected dots who said, oh my God, can we use this differently? But usually these things would not happen if we would not have set up rituals or practices that allow people to connect dots and learn from each other. And so the beautiful thing about these practices is that they allow us to practice what we preach. If you say we are diverse, we allow for diversity of thought, what are the practices that help us translate that? Such as this project funeral, which is all about not celebrating failure, but celebrating the learning from experimentation, the learning from what didn't work. Now that's just a couple of examples then that also help us with creating a purpose-driven culture. Um, what you see with, with quite a few companies is when they have meetings or so, they would always say, okay, if we have these five principles or so, how is every idea, every suggestion that is made in a meeting, does that really relate to that? And do we only decide on those things that really relate to this? Or if we promote someone, do we promote this person just on their financial performance or do we promote them based on how they also generated some kind of societal impact, some kind of environmental impact? So the idea that we integrate the, the idea of purpose and values into every system, every process, rather than just as something that is kind of an individual thing somewhere in a CSR department. Um, of course, that also then necessitates this ongoing communication and measuring it. Uh, it's the beautiful old saying, we only value what we measure. And so if we don't measure our actual impact, uh, then nobody will actually probably take it that seriously. And most importantly, the real incentives, obviously at the end of the day, when we fight for our jobs, when we fight for getting things done, if it's not incentivized also in how we measure it, how we also pay for it, uh, then it might not happen. But the interesting thing is, so we worked over the last kind of um, years on, on these kind of questions um, and, 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 and tried to understand what are these practices. But then the most fascinating thing that came out of um, our work is, you know, when you look at the world nowadays, societal problems, environmental problems, and generally like the bigger issues out there, they are so complex that we can't know them like beforehand, right? We have to somehow a lot of times get closer and closer and closer, and then innovation happens a lot of times unexpectedly. But also more importantly, that throughout history, the most interesting things, you know, most innovations, most inventions have usually come out of unexpected things, right? So um, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Um, this, is, this is just a few examples, but most, like a lot of the sustainability initiatives and companies come from this. Um, can anyone guess what this thing on the bottom right is? Like on the, on the lower right, anyone has a guess what this could be? And if we can have the chat function, I think, uh, if, um, oh no. Washing machine. Like a cooler? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, a washing machine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, so, so, this, so this is a potato washing machine. And so the potato washing machine, um, it's, a, it's a Chinese company I've been doing quite a bit of work with called Hire. They are now the largest white goods company in the world. So they are the largest company with refrigerators, washing machines, 
And so they, um, you know, they produced uh, washing machines and they got calls from farmers. And farmers uh, told them, your washing machine is always breaking down. So they asked, why does it break down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes and somehow it doesn't work. And so what would we usually do when this unexpected thing happened? We would probably say, well, don't wash your potatoes in the washing machine. It's not made for this. It's made for clothes, right? They did the opposite. They said, you know what? This is unexpected, but there's a lot of farmers in China who will probably have the same problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? Now, the same is with a lot of other things, you know, when you think about your life, when you think about maybe some of, 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 of how you found a co-founder, how you found a business partner, how you found an investor, you know, a lot of times it's this kind of unexpected moment where we have to do something with it. And that's the same in science, right? So if you look at the upper right, does anyone has a guess what the upper right could be? That's a good sign. It's, it's a very good sign usually to not, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that is actually a couple of decades ago, some researchers were injecting people with, um, with or giving people medication against agina, uh, the disease, and they saw some movement in male participants' trousers. And you know, what would we usually say? We would say, oh my God, that's embarrassing, right? Uh, that is unexpected, that's a bad side effect, oh my God. They did the opposite. They said, you know what, that is quite embarrassing, but a lot of men might have a problem in that department. So why don't we- Viagra. Exactly. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and, so, and so this is how Viagra evolved, right? Viagra, like most other kind of inventions, innovations, emerged unexpectedly because someone saw something in the moment and then connected the dots to some bigger outcome. That's also the same, you know, how you might have met your love partner in a coffee shop or someone else at a conference. It's not only about running into someone, it's about doing something with it. And so that is with all these different examples. Also, what you see on the lower left here, for example, that's how um, in some countries at the moment, you know, because of, of COVID, um, a lot of breweries, for example, um, had to, didn't have customers anymore. So they had the kind of, uh, you know, they saw the unexpected thing of COVID happening and they said, okay, maybe we can use our alcohol to produce hand sanitizer. And so that's how unexpectedly hand sanitizer company emerged out of breweries because they say we have to use our capabilities in unexpected ways because there's new kind of problems happening out there. And so the problem, the point here is when we mapped different types of um, ideas and, 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 and stories and so on over the last years, what a lot of them have in common is that they are the product of serendipity. You know, like usually when we talk about luck, we talk about this kind of quote unquote blind luck, right? So uh, inheriting something, being born into a good family or, or whatever it is. But serendipity is really about this smart luck, about the, the active luck where we have to do something about it. All the examples I just mentioned have some kind of trigger, right? There's some kind of situation happening where in the case of Viagra, some kind of movement that, that, that happens. Um, in the case of the brewery, COVID happened. Um, in the case of, of the, the project funeral earlier, um, there was this kind of project that didn't work. So that's kind of some kind of trigger that is happening. But then we need someone to connect the dots. We need someone to say, oh, this event, actually, I can relate to something else. And by doing this, we make an accident meaningful. We imbue meaning in an accident. And by doing this, we can then lead to a positive outcome if we have the tenacity, if we have the grit to actually go through and do something with it. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that we miss serendipity most of the time, right? Most of the time, we don't see the unexpected because we, we think we can plan everything out. We think everything has to be mapped out. That's why people a lot of times, you know, when you get unexpected marketing information or other things, we always first want to go through with our plan, but actually a lot of times we could much earlier already kind of, um, you know, change plan if we would be open to, to unexpected information. The same with a lot of other things that we're missing all the time because we, we are not set up for it. Now, there's a lot of uh, fascinating experiments. Um, oh, and by the way, this is, you know, one of the biases, of course, that a lot of us have is, um, and, and, you know, that, that we always plan things out. You know how people kind of, when they talk about their CV, right? They say, oh yeah, I planned this and I did this, I did this. But then life really is more like a squibble, right? My life is more like chuck to chuck to chuck. But then we tell us that if it is step by step by step. The same when you hear people, you know, present to their board, right? They say, yes, my strategic plan is this. And then I plan this and this and this. But a lot of times we can't plan everything. And so one of the things we've seen in, in, in our work is that um, the, the most effective leaders appear to be um, extremely good at setting a sense of direction. So to say, this is approximately where we're going. 
This is approximately what we want to do, but then also have a muscle for the unexpected. They essentially have the ability to say, if our bigger North Star, if our bigger idea is to bring 500 million people into the financial system, and I run into someone in Nicaragua who tells me unexpectedly how I could use a financial system differently, then we are open to this because we know that we cannot have all the answers figured out ourselves. And so it's this mixture between the sense of direction, but also being open and humble enough to, 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 to see the unexpected as an opportunity rather than a threat that then makes them uh, successful around that. And that is really kind of um, something we've been, we've been very interested in. If we have more time later, we can talk about there's fascinating experiments um, around a lot of these areas. Um, I want to briefly mention one just um, because it's one of my, my favorites, also how much it is about framing the world. So they did an experiment in the UK where they took someone who self-identifies as very lucky, so someone who says, good things always happen to me, um, and, and so on, and someone who self-identifies as very unlucky. So someone who says, bad things always happen to me, and so on. And so they tell them, walk down the street, go into a coffee shop, get a coffee, sit down, and then we'll have the interview. That's it. What they didn't tell them is that there's hidden cameras across the street and in the coffee shop. There's a five pound note, so money in front of the coffee shop. And inside the coffee shop, there's only one chair empty. And that's next to this extremely successful businessman who can make big dreams happen. Now, the lucky person walks down the street, sees the five pound note, picks it up, goes inside the shop, orders the coffee, sits down, has a great conversation with the businessman, they exchange business cards, and potentially an opportunity coming out of it. We don't know that. The unlucky person walks down the street, steps over the five pound note, doesn't see it, walks inside, orders the coffee, sits next to the businessman, ignores the businessman, and that's that. Now, at the end of the day, they asked both people who had exactly the same situation, right? They had exactly the same frame. They asked both, how was your day today? And so the lucky person says, it was amazing. I made new friends, the barista and the, the, the businessman. Um, I, I, uh, I found money in the streets and, you know, potential opportunity coming out of it. We don't know that. The unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And, you know, we all see that in our lives, right? That some people seem to be a bit luckier than others, even though they have exactly the same situation. And so that's the, a lot of the fascination we have. What is it that we can do to see the unexpected when it happens, but also then to do something with it and, and to, to, to run with it. And one thing, of course, I want to say, and, and, and by the way, some companies, for example, when they recruit new people, they ask questions such as, do you consider yourself to be lucky? Like, because it's, it's an indicator a lot of times for people, if they can see something in the unexpected, if they can see something that could be innovation or not, because that is a lot about the framing of the world. Um, and so at Zappos, for example, the company that Tony Scheer was leading, um, they had these kind of questions uh, as well. But then, you know, the, the interesting thing is, so a lot of um, the kind of question, of course, then is how do we do this? And Hubert Jolie, who was running Best Buy, um, he, he always um, said this beautiful thing around the way you deal with the unexpected really defines who you are, because it's really kind of, that's where your real colors show, that's where real leadership shows, that's where people look up to someone when, when, when there is a moment of crisis, a moment that, 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 that can't be shown. Um, and, and that's, for example, when the hurricane was uh, happening in Puerto Rico, the first thing Best Buy did is they said, okay, we will work with the local communities, we will get our employees out of the country, but also we will make sure that they can go back. And by doing this, by doing the right thing based on their values, based on the unexpected moments, afterwards the productivity and their kind of loyalty with customers went up absolutely um, strongly because they acted based on their values in the moment of crisis where everyone was watching. And so it's really kind of our reaction to the unexpected and how we go about it. Here's a couple of ideas. I mean, for the sake of time, I won't go too deep into it, but I just wanted to share a couple of practices that we can use as individuals in our teams and then also more broadly um, in, in, in companies to create a culture that allows for serendipity, that allows for unexpected things that then help us to have more innovation and to solve these kind of different um, issues. One, one is really about um, asking questions differently. Um, you know, um, we tend to ask, what do you do um, and on all these questions that put people into boxes and situations into boxes, and then it's very hard to break out of these boxes. And that's the same of how we structure departments, right? If you are a company, for example, that um, like is focused on tomography, so like a particular way of solving a, a health issue, and you have a tomography department, now everyone in the tomography department will only think about solutions that are about tomography, right? Because that is how the department is called. But if you recall the department and say, or rename the department and call it precision diagnosis, 
you still have the same idea that you're focused on diagnosing things. But now it's not only about tomography, you could now also think about, oh, maybe there's completely different ways of how we can fix the same problem. That's the same with the way we ask questions. If we ask them very nar narrowly, we don't give people the opportunity to actually have broader answers um, to that. That's also the way of how we answer to questions, right? I mean, I'm a big fan of this, this amazing entrepreneur in London, Ollie Barrett. If you would ask him, what do you do? He would not just say, I'm a business person or I'm an entrepreneur. He would say, I'm a tech entrepreneur, but recently started reading into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you different hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. My brother is a philosophy of science professor and we're working on a new project. You should cope up with this person. Oh my God, such a coincidence. Our company just started hosting piano matinees. We should have you with us. The point is that we can use every conversation, every situation to see different dots, to see different hooks, where then we allow the other person to connect the dots. And that's the same like with this project funeral example I mentioned earlier. The more we can give people excuses for them to connect the dots, the more it is likely that some quote unquote coincidence can happen and some kind of thing that, that connects the dots um, before us. That's really about this idea also looking at mistakes or crisis differently, finding meaning in, in those kind of situations. Um, and then there's a lot of other ways um, that, that we can discuss later if we have more time. I wanna finish with one that's really one of my favorites also, which is about this idea of reframing situations. Um, there's an organization I've been working with in, uh, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. They came out of uh, Cape, uh, the Cape Flats in Cape Town. And uh, so they are, you know, come out of a very vulnerable community um, where it's crime ridden. It's a very tough environment. And when they go into a local community, they essentially have a low cost methodology for education. So these are 10 steps to um, learn social media. These are 10 steps to build a business. And when they go into a local community, rather than asking, what can we bring into this community? They ask, what is already here? There's an old garage, fantastic. That could be a training center. There's a former drug dealer, fantastic. That person has an amazing social capital, is probably extremely creative. So if we can turn them into a teacher, they will bring a lot of other people in. The point here is that is reframing a situation from resource constraints, this idea of we need a budget, we need this, we need this, to a situation of saying what is already here and how do we make the best out of it? So if they organize an event, for example, instead of just saying, I need 50 chairs for my event, here's the budget I need, they say, no, 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 no. First, think about it the other way around. 50 chairs, do you really need the chairs or can you have people sit on the floor? Um, uh, if you really need the chairs, is there a restaurant next door that could borrow you the 50 chairs? And only if you say no to all these questions, then you, have to, then you are allowed to have the budget with the things. And the beautiful thing is we've applied that in a lot of different companies when it comes to purpose drivenness and so on. And the beautiful thing is people then rethink their budgets and become so much more creative because they get away from, I always need these resources to solve a problem, to the idea of a lot of the resources are already here, we just have to reframe the situation and look at those differently. Again, we can talk about much more uh, of this later. I wanted to um, close on a philosophical note, you know, being the German I am, I, I grew up uh, next to a philosopher's way in Heidelberg where Goethe was writing a lot of his, his work. And Goethe had this beautiful sentence around, or this beautiful idea around, if you take someone as they are, you make them worse, but if you take them as who they could be, you make them capable of becoming who they can be. So this idea is really, everything we just talked about is the idea that serendipity is about potentiality. It's about what could be, and then how do we enable people to become their best selves um, and, and, and to really tackle big societal problems, not by putting people into boxes, by saying, you're a former drug dealer, you're a former this, but actually by seeing what could be, who they could be, and then enabling them to do that. And so that is really kind of the philosophical spirit also behind that kind of serendipity mindset that's about all these different questions of how we actually can cultivate a world like this. My editor tells me to mention that this, this is the book that's out there. Um, so I'm so, um, obviously also delighted to, to share this here. Um, and thank you so much for, for, for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And now I'm very much looking forward to handing back to Aldo and having a wonderful conversation and exchanging some ideas about how has purpose kind of played out in your organizations? Um, how can we really kind of build um, future fit organizations um, that are ready for the unexpected and create some kind of impact in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian, uh, very much for your presentation. Uh, it's uh, really, really, it's kind of a, of a simple thing. It, it's like either you see the, the, the glass em half empty or half full, but 
even even though this is kind of obvious, it's it's hard to swim half full. So you need to to, to practice. I mean, you need to, to change your mindset to 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 really see it half full. So so now we are changing to the to a, to a dialogue. Uh, it's not going to be a, a moderated, so it's going to be a dialogue between Christian and uh, Juan Jose uh, Cordova. Juan Jose Cordova, he's the general manager of Textil del Valle, and between uh, also Maria Julia Sáenz, she's the co legal corporate affairs director at Bacus. So, uh, with no more introduction, please go ahead with the conversation and the dialogue. And please remember, you can you can send questions through the chat so we can make them uh, uh, after the, the, this uh, dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aldo. And uh, yeah, it's such a pleasure to, to have uh, Maria Julia here and, 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 and Juan Toro, uh, two, two exceptional leaders in, in Peru. Um, and um, I, it's essentially two, two questions to get the conversation started. Um, and I'd love to, to start with the first one, which is really, you know, a lot of times when we talk about purpose, when we talk about impact and so on, it's a lot of times disconnected what the leadership says from what actually happens in the day-to-day -day practices of people. And so the, the question really is, what are two practices or initiatives that you've employed in your company that effectively help purpose um, or kind of societal environmental impacts uh, to, to, to drive that in your, in your companies? Um, Maria, do you want to, to start maybe? Thank you, Christian. Yes, uh, I think uh, the first the first practice that I have is basically remain, reminding myself and my team who we are and what, what we are here for. If you think about the purpose of our company, we say that we have the, the, the purpose of bringing people together for a better world. And the question is how this purpose is my purpose as well. As a person who actually try to bring people together or share joy basically with love or in other words in my case talking about abundance and how you can actually talk about abundance if you don't have a heart loving yourself and loving others where you work with so the practice here with the team is always remember who we are and what we are here for and then share if we have the same vision when we are doing our work every day. Uh, my role is really mixed. I have uh, hard uh, commitments related to legal and compliant things. And the other ones that I say always is the hippie way that you actually sharing the purpose with sustainability goals and all the things that we're doing in crisis and not in crisis. So how we can uh, mix this uh, role with this sense of purposes that we always get together and say what we did this week or this month to connect with myself and with the purpose of the company. Uh, which takes me to the second practice that I have is the surprise for the biggest mistake we made. And the one who win the prize is not for the mistake, but for the lessons we learned. How not connect our day by day practice with our purpose the individual one and the corporate one. So I found uh, this practice, the second one, it's very uh, interesting because the bigger, the, the deeper we go to this number of lessons to win the prize, we actually can learn how we can be close to our purposes or uh, away from that. So that's basically simple things that I, that I found myself doing and my team actually appreciated. Yeah. I love how actionable those are. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Julia. And, and that's, that's, that's such, such an interesting prize that you, that you have. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I can imagine how- <laughs> It's always a beer, you know? You really love beer, so. <laughs> <laughs> Everything gets easier then, right? But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Juan, uh, Juan Sol, you, what are your practices? Uh, Juan, you're in mute, sorry. You're in mute, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, first, uh, we have to create awareness to all the organization, our clients of the impact we generate. Nobody in my company had any idea that uh, our industry consumes 50% of the water in the planet, emits 10% of CO2, produce 12% of wastewater, and 5% of solid waste. Uh, we have a big challenge uh, to transform in, and, and away we're doing the things. So 
the other key we, that we use is to tell, to, to know that all the 3,000 workers that we have in the, in the company have to know and be proud of the projects we did in our factory. Uh, today, we generate 50% of the energy with solar panels and we process 40% of the wire with a microfiltration and reverse osmosis plant. Uh, the important thing here, I think, is uh, that we must move with all the companies, with all the workers, with all the world, to, to, from the theory and ideas to the action and the implementation. And that is the way uh, that we are doing now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Wanda. And that's super interesting also in terms of, um, you know, maybe coming directly to my next uh, question there in terms of what, what is the one thing that you learned you wished you had known before you started your exciting uh, journeys? Uh, I was thinking about just to choose one from many things that I learned in these 25 years of experience that I have. And actually it's a simple one. And I think it has to do with my, my gender probably because we women tend to be ready, 100% ready for the next step we wanted to pursue. And we are always uh, at the beginning, at least in my experience, are waiting for waiting to be choose by someone, somebody else. Probably somebody else who's actually making decision for you without asking you. So I really would like to know before that, that I don't need to be chosen. That if I wanted to pursue an opportunity, maybe I'm not ready 100%, but I will be in the process because we're learning in the process by but actually uh, committing some mistakes. So if I have something that I actually, I really, really, really choose that, is that, that I don't need to be chosen, that I don't need to be full ready for something else. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, that's, that's also very, I think that's beautiful, you know, when you have quotes afterwards for like a nice Peru sustainability uh, quote. I think that sounds like a beautiful quote to put on a, on a sign, no? Uh, <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, Juanjo? Uh, yeah, like, like, like Maria Julia, no? And unfortunately, the textile industry is the second most polluting industry in the world after the oil industry. I think before I start this journey, I would like to know more about how to minimize the impact of my company in the environment faster. Uh, to lose the fear of transforming, to convince the board and my organization more faster to take the way of sustainability as a competitive advantage and to do the most sustainable textile company in the world. To convince me that sustain sustainability is a synonym of prof profitability. That is very important. Uh, believe me, we can all do this. It's just a matter of making up our minds and being patient. Everything comes in good time. So uh, for me, the most important thing here is because I live that. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, Textile Del Valle uh, wants to transform first the people of our community and also the sector here in Peru. But uh, the sustainability comes with profitability. Uh, that is uh, important. And, and, and I was afraid in the, when I initialed this, this way, but uh, then when you take the correct way, uh, you are convinced that that is the way. So uh, let's do it. And, and, and I invite everyone to, to go in that way. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, and I think that, that now I will give the, the baton back to, to Aldo, who will uh, moderate the Q&A with, uh, with everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Huele and, uh, and Juan. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Christian. Well, we have some, some questions here I would like to, to share. The first one is, uh, what are your thoughts about how can a serendipity mindset could be linked to the current social and environmental sustainability around the, the world and the SDGs? Is there a connection? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think it links really back to this idea that the, like societal and environmental questions are so complex. And I'm sure you're all dealing with this complexity of, of you know, 
like traditionally when you had a shampoo or something, you just kind of like innovate a little bit and you have a better shampoo, right? Like that's fantastic and that's great, but like it doesn't require that much of, a, of an effort of actually not knowing what you will need in the future versus um, here, you know, when you have, have intricate issues around community dynamics, uh, working with local communities and so on, there's so many variables that are in play that it, it makes it much more complex. And so the, the thing here is that to me that comes down to, this is mostly a mindset question of how the people who are working on these problems are able to navigate this. How are they able to navigate cross-sector partnerships that will always start with one idea, but then, you know, over time um, um, things change and you have to figure out how to work on a slightly different challenge that might emerge. And, you know, my work, I've, I've been working on social impact particularly for, 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 for quite a long time. And one of the things I've realized is we start with one assumption. So, for example, uh, in education, you know, we might think it's great to educate a boy in uh, Kenya's low income contexts and put them into school. And as an organization, then we say, we were quote unquote successful in educating the child, right? So quote unquote, our output was great so societally because we educated the boy. But now maybe, you know, the boy goes home and the father is blind, the mother is pregnant and there's only a sister and the boy would be the only person who brought in the money to the family. And now because you put the boy in school, there's no revenue stream for the family. And so I've seen examples where then what happens is, yes, you have a good output in terms of having someone trained, but actually the, there's a negative uh, outcome for the community and for the family, because now the boy, essentially the sister now has to bring in the money in the family, and there's not many options for a girl in that context to bring in the money, but also there's no revenue stream for the family. And so if, if and, and, and there's kind of like resentment of the family towards the boy that he can enjoy this education but they don't understand the language anymore he speaks because they, they were not educated in that. And so it's really that idea of when we think about these things, we a lot of times then realize along the lines, oh my God, we have to find a revenue stream for the family. Or you realize, oh my God, um, we have to find a way that um, we, we can uh, um, educate the whole family and so on, right? So there's, there's things that, that a lot of times when it comes to those like more complex problems that we have to learn it as we go. And that is, is, is so much about um, mindset and I think with most sustainable development goals, when we work with kind of multi-sector coalitions, we cannot know in advance everything. We have to learn it from each other. And so if we don't have that mindset a lot of times, you know, we, we, we get into this perfection mode that we think we have everything planned out, we can plan it out, and so we don't really learn, and that's how these things break down. And so it's really um, kind of saying, at the end of the day, this mindset allows us to, to navigate a world that is more complex than we thought. And you know, as someone, I grew up in Germany, so we get trained in this kind of business planning idea of you know, what most business schools also train, that like you can have a clear strategy and you go from A to Z, but that's just not the world anymore that we live in. And so it's really saying, how do we develop a mindset that allows us to have a bigger purpose as a company or as a, as a coalition, but then essentially also allow ourselves to say, we have to build a way that we can learn from each other and don't see it as an imperfection that something doesn't work. But that's what I loved about Maria, Maria uh, Julia's point, that, that we actually celebrate learning from things that don't work because that allows people to also be transparent to learn from each other about things that didn't work. And that's where the real learning is. That's where we will really tackle the big solutions. And so I think that's where, where a lot of the, the impetus comes from, that the world is just too complex for simple solutions that we can map out from day one. And so um, that, that mindset hopefully helps us um, with that. Um, it's also, um, thank you so much, by the way, for sharing the link. Um, in the chat, you can see the link to Viktor Frankl, um, which is this wonderful um, 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 uh, person we talked about in terms of seeing meaning in every situation. Um, and also, yes, we'll be delighted to, I think, um, uh, so uh, Alejandro will be delighted to share the slides as well um, with, with the participants, uh, definitely as well. Uh, but thank you so much, Arturo, for the great question um, and, and Alejandro for, for that um, as, as well. Great. Uh, I, I think we have time for one more question, and, and I'm going to try to, to link what you have said with purpose. You, you, you've worked a lot around purpose and have a lot of uh, interaction with leaders and companies on how to, to introduce purpose as, as a core part of the business. And you have also talked about uh, a mindset, a mindset uh, uh, regarding seeing a situation either as a problem or as, a, as an opportunity. What two, thi what two uh, things, uh, uh, from your experience, uh, should CEOs or leaders do more, and what two things should we do less in our day-to-day? -day? Yeah. 
And that, that's a that's a fantastic uh, point, and, and thank you, Aldo and, and Alvaro, for 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 that uh, great great thought. Uh, because so when I think about why a lot of times companies have employees, especially also that are uh, unhappy about uh, companies that become more purpose driven, is because there's this disconnection between what the executive team says and what the actual um, feeling is in the day to day. Are we really part of something bigger? And even big companies like Unilever for some time had that problem, right? That like Yes, it's, it's one thing when, when you have like a big idea out there, what can be done, but do I really feel this in the day to day? And so I think um, one of the things that, that Paul Pullman was really good at was to say, how do we in a way try to break that into a rhythm that allows us to do that? So what, one thing I really liked about what, what, what Pullman did um, was obviously he said, okay, I will, I will try to not do um, as much kind of focus on quarterly reporting or like things that are short term, right? That, that force people into like a short term kind of financial logic, but I will try to give more time and we'll try to do reporting annually. Of course, there's, you know, like there's, 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 you know, publicly listed companies have to report in some way, but it's more about the underlying logic behind it. Do I give people time and space to breathe in the mid run and to have time to develop some initiatives or do I directly make it a market logic over the, the short run, which usually kind of cuts a lot of projects very short. And so I think it's kind of one introducing that logic that yes, in the short term, a lot of times there is a trade off. And, and I think we can't lie to each other that like a lot of times when we tackle societal problems and environmental problems at the beginning, there might be an investment that is needed. Right. So it's it just it doesn't come just like this and, and that's that. But then actually in the mid run to the long run, that's how you build the real capacity of the organization to be innovative, to, to do something. I always love the example, uh, one of the companies I've been working with, they built in the tension between environmental, social and financial from day one, not necessarily because they wanted to solve big problems, but because they said it will make our people more creative to constantly think about what does this mean for the environment? What does this mean for this? And that friction then led to really positive outcomes, but only if people had time for that. And so I think the one is really the time component, like how do we create some, some of this? Um, and then rituals that relate to it. And I really loved what Maria uh, Julia had earlier, like, you know, rituals such as kind of um, celebrating things that, that, that were experimentation. Of course, we all want to avoid mistakes that are avoidable, right? And like, we should never kind of reward quote unquote stupid mistakes, right? Because stupid mistakes, like they can be avoided, right? But when you're really innovating, when you're really kind of trying to tackle big societal problems, a lot of times they need experimentation. And I, I love the mindset that's behind what Maria Julia said in terms of that, if we celebrate those that, that take a little bit of risk and that that's where, where a lot of the change comes from. So I think the second aspect is really about the rituals that are related to it. Um, and so if I were, if I were in, in that position, I would say the first thing is really thinking more strategically about what is the setup of the company? Do we allow people the space to create that impact? And does that um, reflect itself in uh, the way we reward people in our performance reviews? Do we talk about things like values? Do we talk about how someone achieved something rather than just what they achieved? Right. So the kind of values that were behind it and so on. So do we really integrate that into the day to day, how people think about they get remunerated, they get incentivized. And then the second is really about like, okay, how do we really um, develop these practices that help us to do that? And so stopping doing is really this idea of just putting, I will never forget, I did an executive session a couple of years ago where I went in and it was all the board members and I asked, so tell me what are your values and what are specific practices that like really showcase your values to your employees that they're part of it. And there was silence. And then after some point, someone said, let me quickly Google this. So they had to go to the homepage of their company to try to figure out what could be initiatives that relate to this. And obviously this is, everyone feels that in the company, right? If, if it's not genuine what the leadership team says. And so it's really about this idea of if we make statements like this, how does it really, what are the concrete practices we have in our companies to, to really um, and do something about this? And so I'm a big fan of, of stopping to just have statements and declarations because nobody believes it anyways. Um, if it's just a statement to like, okay, here are the concrete practices. This is the concrete impact and really starting to measure that impact because that's where the credibility comes from measuring that impact and, and really kind of having people see it um, in, in action. And then I think that's where the communication aspect comes in, right? Celebrating examples, celebrating things that worked and, and so on. But thank you so much for, for these wonderful uh, questions. And again, I'm, I'm a big believer that most of the knowledge is in this room. So I hope also maybe if there's a way to capture the ideas of, of participants, if there's additional ideas you wanted to bring in. Um, we did this uh, at the beginning, of course, where we asked you, what are you most interested in? And try to frame the question a bit around, you know, you were interested in innovation and 
and how to think differently about tackling ideas. So I hope we, we did some of this, but I'm sure there's so much in this room that, that could be shared. And so, um, yeah, we'd be delighted to, to keep in touch. Please um, make sure to, to connect also. And um, thank you so much again for organizing this, uh, this session. Thank you, Christian, uh, very much indeed. Uh, we are out of time just for this section. Uh, Maria Julia, Juan Jose, muchísimas gracias. Uh, uh, contigo nuevamente, Micaela. Gracias.